So what is astigmatism? Chances are at some point you went in to have an eye exam and your doctor said that you have astigmatism in your eyes. But what is astigmatism? So today we're going to be really deep dive, deep, what is it? diving deep into what astigmatism is, how somebody with astigmatism may see the world in terms of how they view everything through their eyes, and then what astigmatism looks like on the human eye, including how we diagnose it in the eye clinic. Then we'll be going over what causes astigmatism, including how we can cure or treat astigmatism in the eye clinic, whether it be with something like glasses, contact lenses, or even like LASIK eye surgery. So first off, uh, if you're catching us live here or catching us on the replay, uh, please drop a comment, say hello, let us know if you have ever been diagnosed with astigmatism, and if you wear glasses, contacts, or perhaps you've had eye surgery already. Now, this entire education is brought to you by our channel membership. And if you have not seen our channel membership, it is kind of a great supporting way to, to help support our channel, our mission, to help bring eye and vision education to the world so people can learn uh, about different eye diseases, their treatments, and how you can better improve your eyesight and vision. So a huge thank you and shout out to all of our channel supporting members. If you want to know more about how you can join, we'll have links in the video description as well as in the comments and chat box off to the side. So what is astigmatism? Well, the, the term astigmatism is loosely translated from Greek, which means A, without, and then stigma, which means to a point. So it means without a point. And this is referring to the optics of the eye. In a perfect world, the optics of the eye would shine light and come to a perfect focal point in the back of the eye onto the retina, which would give you clear vision. However, unfortunately, the human eye is not perfect. And so people often will have light not focus onto a single point, but multiple points. And that's really what astigmatism is. It's this irregular aberrations, not able to focus to a single point in the back of the eye. So how does somebody see with astigmatism? So I took a picture here of one of the vision charts that I often bring with me when I go on like a mission trip or something like that. Or maybe you've seen a chart like this, maybe in a doctor's hallway or even at like a school screening. On the left side, this is a perfectly clear picture of a vision chart. Should come in nice and clear. On the opposite side, I was able to put a loose lens that would mimic astigmatism. And you can see how everything's a little bit blurry. Even though this was done fairly close up, it's still a bit blurry and the edges of everything is a little bit fuzzy. Like it's not as clear, sharp edges as the image on the left side. But this also happens at distance. So I was able to go outside and thankfully it was a pretty nice day out. You could see the trees. Uh, but with astigmatism, everything's a little bit fuzzy. It's hard to make out the distinct leaves on the tree. Uh, again, even the cars are a little bit hard to make out. You can't see as much detail. And that's really what happens with astigmatism is it affects all distances. So you may be farsighted, you may be nearsighted, or you may be emetropic where your refractive power is essentially zero. You have al almost perfect eyes. But then astigmatism affects all those distances. So, so it's blurry at far away and up close. One common thing that I see a lot of my patients who come in to see me and they'll describe during the better one or two test, you know, is it better one, better two? We're showing them different lenses to correct their vision. And they'll say the letters all look kind of doubled. And oftentimes it's not perfectly doubled. It's almost like the letters are like kind of side by side. And really they're referring to what's called ghosting. And let me know again in the comments or in the chat if you guys have ever seen letters kind of like this. And sometimes the letters can be ghosted side by side or maybe up and down, or even if your astigmatism is at kind of an angle, maybe the letters look like they're spaced out kind of like in a diagonal. So a lot of people will see that. And then on internet, you may have seen text images get thrown around or, or, or some sort of social media post that looks like this, where you see all these kind of glare spots and it looks like a starburst. So this is often 
referred to as astigmatism or what people would see with it. And in reality, anybody who has blurred vision may see the world like this. Uh, and the, the truth uh, I kind of dug into is this really what astigmatism looks like to people. This really isn't quite a true uh, like depiction of astigmatism. This what you see with the starbursts effect is, is called diffraction spiking and is a problem with glare and a consequence of an like an imperfect uh, optical system. And we'll dive deeper into glare and different types of glare and how it affects the human eyesight, as well as ways to negate it and it kind of get rid of glare in a future video here on this channel. So if you haven't already subscribed to the channel and hit that little follow or little bell button to notify you when there's new videos come out, do that because when that video releases, then you'll be able to see that and learn everything about it so you don't miss it. So really what causes astigmatism? Well, the most common cause of astigmatism is corneal shape. It has to do with the front surface of your eye. On the front surface of the eye, you have the cornea, and that's uh, the front window to the eye. And some people kind of confuse that with the iris, because when you're looking straight at somebody, you see the colored part of the eye. But really, the cornea is the front clear window that's on top of the eye there. And that's where if you put a contact lens on, that's where the contact lens rests. The corneal shape is often not perfectly round. It ends up being kind of bent. And I drew a little red line on this photo on the side. So you can kind of see that there's a little bit of abandoned contour to the cornea. And oftentimes doctors will describe this as comparing a perfect eye that doesn't have astigmatism to a basketball because it's perfectly spherical and round to a football, which is a little bit longer curved on one side versus the other. And honestly, I've never really loved that analogy as a student or really as a young kid, as a teenager. I was confused because I'd go to the mirror and I'd look at myself and I'm like, yeah, the eye shape, it's like a football. But isn't everybody's eyes shaped that way? So I found it kind of confusing as a young kid. So I often tell my patients, instead of it being perfectly round like a, a basketball, imagine a five-year-old sat on that basketball and squished it just a little bit. Uh, but really, we're talking about the curvature to the cornea. The cornea shape is not as, as round in one direction as it is the other. So how do we measure astigmatism? So in the eye clinic, you may be seeing this device called a ferropter. This device, uh, most eye doctors should be able to even just during this test, kind of determine that you may have some astigmatism by shining a light in your eye that's called retinoscopy. And that it will usually at least give a tip off to a doctor that, that you have some level of astigmatism. However, there's a lot more other, uh, more advanced and scientific uh, procedures and instruments that we use now to accurately not just determine the amount of prescription needed to correct astigmatism, but we can visualize the astigmatism on the surface of the eye. One of these instruments is called corneal topography. Uh, in this picture, you see a little bit of uh, this instrument with some red rings on it. That's using what's called placido disc technology. But when you look through that, it'll shine these little rings onto the surface of the eye and the kind of computer in there notices the small differences in the reflection of those rings off of your tear film. And any like irregularity in those reflections, it then kind of computes into a topographical map of the surface of your eye. Kind of like you're looking down onto a, a map with a bunch of mountains and hills and valleys. It is able to determine those subtle changes in elevation. And so in the clinic, uh, especially if you came in to see us at our clinic, we don't just have a topographer. We have something kind of a step above that. This is called a tomographer. A tomographer, uh, this one specifically is called a pentacam. This one takes almost a 3D, 360 degree, almost MRI of the front surface of the eye. So we're able to measure not just the curvature changes in the front part of the eye, but the back part of the cornea as well. Um, again, for an example, you can see the curvature to the eye here on the cornea. And then this is a, an exact, what's called a Schleimflug image of my cornea that I took a few years ago. And with this image, you can see the even the distinct layers of the cornea. It's quite fascinating. So if somebody has a scar, we can even see the scar in the front surface of the cornea. Uh, 
And then because this image takes a 360 degree image of the cornea, we can create a 3D map of what that cornea looks like. But from a top-down view, again, it's a topographical sort of evaluation, this is what astigmatism looks like on my right eye. Now, anybody who's looking at this may be kind of confused and not sure what they're looking at, but think of it like you're staring at a globe. The blue would be kind of the water, it's kind of lower, flatter surface, where the green is more like, think of it like elevation in a way. Uh, it's truly not elevation. The green is more of a depiction of curvature, but I think it's easy to think of it like you're looking at a globe because you can easily see where those two islands kind of meet in the center. Now, in the eye, now, when you go to school to be an eye doctor, they teach you to identify the bow tie because looking back here on my right eye, the two green islands, they come together and it kind of looks like a bow tie. Now, with that bow tie, we're able to identify the type of astigmatism someone has because there's a couple of different types. Uh, the first type I just want to describe here is called against the rule astigmatism because this is my eye, which is a little bit of anomaly because I'm young. I'm below the age of 40. And most people who are younger have what's called with the rule astigmatism, which we'll cover in a second. Um, but as people get older, there's a general trend that people will develop against the rule astigmatism. And that's where the flatter power, less power is in the vertical meridian going up and down in this photo. And there's more power bent off to the sides. Now, with the rule of stigmatism, that's where the bow tie is kind of up and down. You can see where the power is more flatter along the horizontal meridian and steeper in kind of the, the vertical direction. It's kind of like if I took a cornea here, if you can see in the, in the camera, it's like somebody pinched it from up and down. And the cornea is now, instead of it being perfectly round, it has been pinched. That's essentially what we're looking at. Then there's also where it's not side to side or up and down. It's instead oblique. It comes at an angle. Thankfully, this isn't as common, uh, but people who have oblique astigmatism may have more challenges getting fit into things like contact lenses because most contact lenses that are fit for astigmatism have a weight built into them. And that weight kind of gets thrown off a little bit uh, because of the toricity or the angle of that astigmatism. And then, unfortunately, some people can have what's called irregular astigmatism. This is where you don't have just one single power line. The lines kind of bend off in weird directions, and the cornea can be rather steep, and usually this is inferior part of the eye. This can be due to scarring on the eye if you've had trauma or an infection. This could even be due to surgical complications if you've had surgery on the eye, or perhaps you have a corneal disease such as keratoconus, or in this case, this picture we're seeing here, you can see the, the green edges of the island almost pinch in the middle, and we call that a kind of a crab claw appearance, which we call pellucid marginal degeneration, which is kind of a milder form of keratoconus. <coughs> mm. Excuse me, I'm just recovering from a cold, so uh, that's why my voice is a little raspy today. So keratoconus, I do want to mention, and I have a couple of videos and a little playlist going deeper into keratoconus, if that's something you've ever been diagnosed with or someone in your family has keratoconus. This is where somebody has uh, a corneal degeneration, where the surface, the corneal tissue begins to uh, progressively thin over their lifetime, and the cornea begins to protrude like a cone, hence the name keratoconus. Uh, and because of this, they have high levels of irregular astigmatism that, again, progresses through their lifetime, at least until their middle age. And they have severe vision problems because of all the distortions in their eyesight, because their astigmatism is usually so high. Now, the question is, a lot, a lot of times I get people asking, like, how did they get astigmatism in the first place? And... Does it get worse over time? Like, do they have to worry about it getting worse and worse? Now, there are a couple different theories. Uh, and I dug into some of the research, um, not just what I had in my old textbooks from my school days, but then I tried to look up some more recent publications in case things changed. Uh, one of the biggest things that we have noticed is there is a genetic link. Uh, typically, people of East Asian descent 
uh, Native Americans as well as people of more Hispanic lineage. And that kind of makes sense because of uh, common ancestors, which crossed the Bering Strait and world history down into the Americas and into South America. Uh, that genetic lineage does tend to have higher amounts of uh, stigmatism. Another kind of theory is eyelid tightness. And you can think that if somebody has smaller set eyes and they have really tight eyelids, that they the eyelids may push on the cornea as the eyelids come down, creating more of with the rule astigmatism. And there is some, a little bit confirmation of this theory as Again, as people get older, there seems to be a trend of less with the rule, and then they form more against the rule of stigmatism as we age. And the theory is that our eyelid tension becomes less as we get older because just uh, the tissues in our skin and face become more lax. And so I guess in some ways I have old man eyes because I am against the rule. Uh, another theory is eye muscle tension. And this seems to play a larger role in young individuals like babies, because when we're first born, most kids, about 50 percent of most babies born have about two diopters of astigmatism. And that's mostly due because babies are very malleable. They have hyperflexibility. Their collagen in their eyes and their face have not locked in. And the eye muscles can put some tension on the eye and almost stretch the eye in a way and so most babies, again, are, are usually born with some level of astigmatism. And then by about the age of one years old, most children have their eyes have already formed and a lot of their astigmatism goes away. Uh, into adulthood, about 15% of adults walking around have about one diopter of astigmatism and less than 2% of adults have about three diopters of astigmatism or more. Uh, nutrition may play a role. There's some theories with that. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, nutrition may play a role in that if somebody's malnourished, especially in early development of their life, that perhaps the collagen of their cornea may not firm up properly, and that may play a role in astigmatism as well. So, um, oops. as far as can astigmatism be cured, uh, well, there's different treatments. It's tough to say if it's truly a cure, but in the eye clinic, the probably the easiest way, most economical way of, of treating astigmatism is with glasses. Now, glasses, if you have a small amount of astigmatism, it's usually not a big deal. But if you're somebody who has, I'm looking for a pair of my own glasses here. If you have a high amount of astigmatism, then the centration of your lenses is really important. Just a small amount of tweaking, or if your glasses are sitting incorrectly on your face, then you're not going to be looking through the perfect spot to correct astigmatism fully. And so your vision may blur a lot. In fact, a lot of eye doctors, we know and were trained in school that if somebody has a lot of astigmatism, we have to we have to pay really close attention to how much we rotate the lenses in the glasses. Um, so if you're somebody who does have a lot of astigmatism, I encourage you always get your glasses professionally adjusted. And if you feel like they are bent or crooked to again, get them adjusted because you will see a significant improvement in your vision with that. The, um, the next thing is really contact lenses. Now I, Personally, I uh, love contact lenses. It's been a huge passion of mine since I was a student. Uh, contact lenses changed my life as a 13-year-old um, in junior high because it got me out of glasses, into contacts, and I could play sports and socialize a lot better, boosted my self-confidence. There's a lot of great reasons to get into contacts, especially if you have a, a kid at home. Uh, there are contact lenses for astigmatism. Now, the challenge is that not all correction, all, all different levels of astigmatism can be corrected with just soft contact lenses, the easier, cheaper ones on the market. Uh, there are some uh, contact lenses for astigmatism or toric lenses, which go up to high levels, but they often need to be custom made and they take a little bit longer to order and they become a little bit more expensive. There are hard or RGP, rigid gas permeable contact lenses. These ones can 
really improved people's vision with astigmatism in many ways, mostly because it masks that irregularity distortion on the cornea. And people will often say they see better with those types of contacts than they'd even do with glasses because it can mask those distortions on the eye and in many ways just make letters and, and images in your world seem sharper. Then there are a specialty contact lens called scleral contact lenses. These are great not just for people with diseased corneas or something like keratoconus or post-surgery, that's where these really shine, but people who have just higher amounts of astigmatism that aren't diseased, or if you're somebody who just wants to see the sharpest you possibly can, scleral contact lenses may be a good option. But not every eye doctor fits them. You may have to search around or ask, and the price tag can be a little bit steep, um, usually costing somewhere in the one to $2,000 range to be fit in these specialty custom contact lenses. But they really can give you amazing vision if you have high amounts of astigmatism. And then eye surgery. What are your options for eye surgery? Because I know a lot of people will come in and ask, hey, uh, I wish I could get LASIK, but my previous doctor told me that I am not a good candidate because I have astigmatism. And unfortunately, I'm not sure where that comes from because it's not true. Uh, astigmatism can be corrected with refractive surgery procedures such as LASIK uh, up to a certain point. Here in the United States, uh, the FDA has approved uh, astigmatism correction up to about a negative five, uh, possibly a negative six, I believe. However, most forms of LASIK, PRK, or even the SMILE procedure, which is a newer form of uh, kind of like LASIK, uh, and I've done videos on these topics and kind of the pros and cons. Uh, if you want to learn more, we'll have that video. Uh, but when it comes to the powers, most surgeons don't like to go above about a three diopters of astigmatism. Uh, that's just because the higher you go with that, the more likely there is to be some errors or there's an increased risk of needing a touch up or a second procedure. Uh, ultimately, though, uh, whether or not you're a good candidate for something like LASIK or another refractive eye surgery to correct for astigmatism, it's something you will have to consult with a local doctor about so that they can tell if you have enough corneal thickness to do those procedures or even if um, your, your refractive power is really going to work for that. Or perhaps there's another procedure such as maybe having cataract surgery, uh, maybe a better option because there are cataracts that correct for a stigma to uh, cataract implants um, or uh, these are intraocular lenses that are plastic implants that go inside the eye after the cataract's been removed that can be made toric or correcting for some level of astigmatism. So that uh, is really your best options when it comes to uh, everything about astigmatism, kind of what causes it, how we diagnose it, and the ways that we can treat it. I'm sure many of you have other questions regarding um, maybe eye surgery or if there's anything you can do about your astigmatism, uh, and I'm happy to answer those coming up. Um, as far as just Q&A. We're going to do some live Q&A now. I do want to give a shout out to all of our members again. Thank you so much for supporting. And if you want to, uh, again, get priority in our live Q&A, if you want to participate in choosing the topic of the next lecture or live stream that we are going over, um, then please consider uh, joining our cause. And then before we begin, uh, go ahead and start letting me know questions. I see a couple of people commenting. Thank you. Um, we'll definitely start answering some questions right away. Uh, but I do want to give just a medical advice disclaimer that I can't give you personal medical advice with our live Q&A. Uh, but I can try to just provide education around a topic uh, and try my best to answer any questions you can so that people can learn. And chances are, if you have a question, a thousand other people are having that same exact question. I hope to keep everything around astigmatism or other forms of refractive error, such as farsightedness, nearsightedness, or presbyopia. Um, but otherwise, please, uh, yeah, let us know your questions. I do see um, Louise had said, just mentioned that he had ICL. Um, ICL, if you haven't heard of that, I have done one video reviewing that. That's called an intracolumnar lens, uh, or some people refer to it as, refer to it as an implantable con contact lens. This is a, another form of refractive surgery. It's usually best for people with high prescriptions and originally was not 
approved for astigmatism correction in the United States, but a few years ago, it finally was FDA approved. So this may be a great option, especially if you have a higher amount of myopia or nearsightedness along with the astigmatism. Some of the benefits of ICL include that it is potentially a reversible procedure because they're implanting a, a lens inside the eye. And if something goes wrong or they need to change out a different power um, or you choose to just abort and say, hey, we're not going to do it, they can always take out that lens afterward and then the eye can heal up. So some great some great things with ICL. Um, I know Maxine asks, glasses or plastic lens, which is better? Uh, in terms of... Uh, are you, I imagine you're asking if having your glasses made out of true glass versus plastic, like which is better. Their glasses historically were made of true glass or crown glass. Harder to find these days. Uh, there are some downsides to having glass lenses because they shatter much easier um, and they're very heavy. However, if you can get true glass lenses, the optics are amazing and you probably will see you'll have the sense that your vision is a little bit better with glass glasses, glass spectacles. Um, but again, there's some risks and they may not be super comfortable. Most glasses that are manufactured for spectacle lenses are now made out of different forms of plastic, which are, are, are very comparable. Um, but true glass spectacle lenses are still uh, amazing if you can get them. I usually try to get my non-RX like sunglasses made in glass glass material because there is an optical difference that people can tell. Um, let's see. This is an interesting question from, from June. Um, two parents biopic, so nearsighted. Uh, why is chance of a child being more 50% and not 100%? And this really falls down to a chicken egg sort of debate or nature versus nurture debate. I think that's better. Uh, certainly genetics plays a large role in a lot of part of um, our bodies, our development, uh, and certainly with nearsightedness and our need for glasses. Uh, however, there is a big role in our environment. I think of genetics kind of like having light switches on a wall, but your environment is going to determine which one of those uh, light switches gets turned on or turned off. And that can include not just your physical environment around you, but also what type of like foods or different um, things you ingest the environment inside of you. So there's a lot of research into the genetics. But they do find that if you have at least one parent who's nearsighted, then you have about a 25-30% chance of your, your children being nearsighted. And then if both parents, it's like 50 to 60% uh, risk for nearsightedness. And even more so if parents are highly nearsighted or highly or severely myopic, uh, which is a significant factor in all of that. The best thing for children uh, or parents who are worried about their children becoming nearsighted like they are is to have them try to be outside more often than being indoors and having them try to balance out lots of extended amounts of near work, uh, not just on the computer and a phone or a tablet, but even reading a book. If your child does a lot of near work, which is important for school, you want to try to balance that out, taking breaks every 30 minutes and try to have them spend at least two hours outdoors every day um, and trying to spend just more time outdoors. That's based off of um, a lot of research that's been ongoing and we've been getting a lot more uh, a lot more research coming out about myopia control and the myopia epidemic uh, in just the last 10, 15 years. And I do plan to have a multi-part part series coming out in a few months on myopia of the different research and strategies that can be employed to help slow down nearsighted development. Uh, but thank you. That's a good question. Um, we've got a lot of stuff coming in here. Um, let me first bring up Vanessa, who's one of our channel members. Thank you for your support, Vanessa. How does my site contact lenses help myopia in children? Uh, so my site lenses are a soft contact lens that comes from the, the company called Bosch and Loam. Um, and 
or, or correct me if I'm wrong, it might not be Bosch and Loma. I think it's Cooper Vision. That's correct. Um, now, the MySight lens has been FDA approved for ages 8 to 12 here in the United States. Uh, and it's a soft contact lens that uses a, a type of peripheral defocus type of technology. It's kind of like having a multifocal contact lens on the eye, but it sends sort of mixed signals to the retina. And it's not fully understood yet, but we know that how light focuses in the back of the eye can somehow talk to the brain and how the eyes grow and develop. Again, not fully understood, but there is good research showing that contact lenses like the MySight lens can slow down the rate of myopia development by up to 50%, if I'm not incorrect or mistaken on that, on that research. Um, but uh, it's a great option, especially for young children, um, like ages eight, who have myopia or risk of it progressing, then they often can be fit in these lenses, learn how to put them in, take them out on their own and be responsible. And that can significantly reduce their risk of myopia getting worse, needing not only stronger prescriptions, but then with that higher amounts of myopia, they're at higher risk of eye diseases like glaucoma, um, maculopathy as they get older and blinding retinal disease, uh, and then even retinal detachments. So significant and that's a big hyper focus in the eye care world right now is, is learning everything we can and, and different types of strategies to slow down myopia. So thank you. Thank you again for just um, understanding. I'm getting over a cold. Uh, so thank you. Um, there's a lot of other people coming on. So thank you. Um, Jen asks for, uh, are neural lenses better for astigmatism? That's a really good question. So uh, neural lens are a, a special type of glasses lens that not many eye clinics offer. It's been growing in popularity the last several years. I've actually been testing out the neural lenses myself for the last few months. Um, kind of taking some days off, full weeks on, full weeks off, take measuring my um, symptoms. And I'm going to have a video reviewing them shortly. Uh, as, for, as far as astigmatism, I don't, I can't really say there's evidence saying that neural lenses are better for astigmatism versus not. They have to do more with how your eye muscles work and coordinate together uh, and other neurological um kind of symptoms. So uh, I wouldn't say for astigmatism specifically, but um, definitely watch out for that future video coming up. Uh, let's see what else. We have a question from Marcelo. Uh, what is new in multifocal torix? So this is, uh, again, astigmatism. This is a great lens for people who have astigmatism, people who are usually press biopic or need some sort of correction to help them see up close, right? Because as we get above the age of 40, the crystalline lens inside of the eye, right? If I hold up the eye model here, this crystalline lens inside, which is pulled on by this muscle, inside the eye called the ciliary body, uh, that the muscles still work as you get older, but the lens itself starts to become rigid and stiff. And so that's why people start having to wear reading glasses or you need bifocals or progressives or varifocal lenses. Uh, but multifocal contacts exist. But multifocals have a very unique type of optics built into those contact lenses. And they can make it a little difficult to see super sharp, especially if you have astigmatism. So thankfully, uh, there have been some previous lenses, an older one from the ProClear design, which had a multifocal torque, um, but most doctors I've talked to have never had really good success fitting those multifocal torque contact lenses. Uh, but in just a few years ago, a Bosch & Lohm product uh, did come out with a multifocal torque. And that one's a monthly contact lens. I wish it came in a daily. But um, as far as the multifocal torque design, it's a lot more stable and a lot more people have had success with it. With that being said, my my personal rate of like success fitting that lens is not 100%, but it's pretty good. I would say at least 80% of the time, patients I fit it in, they, they do enjoy that lens and they can see a lot better and have freedom from having to rely on reading glasses uh, or any other methods like that. 
Um, Ooh, thank you. Mathematical biologist. Uh, how safe is Contura vision surgery? So Contura vision surgery is really just a different form of LASIK. Contura is kind of a branded, trademarked, uh, wavefront guided type of, uh, or wavefront assisted LASIK. This is a type of kind of computerized eye that uses the topographical data uh, from scanning the surface of the eye to notice where like little deformities in the entire like landscape of all the mountains and peaks and valleys on the surface of the eye and really minute um, changes. And then they're able to program that into a computer. So when LASIK is performed, the computer like almost, almost creates a perfect cornea. That's really what it is. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so that's uh, usually Contura, or there's a few other brands um, that are go that have gone that direction in terms of technology. So for people who are going to get LASIK, if I was going to get LASIK myself, I would talk to uh, surgeons in in my area about what advanced technology they have, such as Contura or other wave guided assisted technology. Um, and so. Uh, that's that's kind of the probably the best way to go. Um, I know just because we're on that same topic, does ICL have higher risk than LASIK? So ICL in some ways has a higher risk of complications because ICL is an invasive procedure into the eye. They have to, it's similar to cataract surgery where they have to make a small about two millimeter incision to get inside of the eye. Um, so you do have a little bit higher cost because you have to go inside of the operating room. They have to be a little bit more cautious about infection and just making sure everything's taken care of. Uh, however, um, outside of that for complication rate, ICL has a lot more benefits, less chance of dry eye like you get with LASIK and other things like that. Um, but the chances of having an infection or other complications in the OR is very, very low. Um, but a good question to ask your refractive surgeon in your area. Evelyn asks, um, being 67, will AccuView contacts for astigmatism be okay? I can't say if you're, because I haven't done an exam on your eyes. I don't know that information, so I can't give like a direct yes answer, no to that. Um, AccuView contacts for astigmatism, though. Uh, AccuView is a is a kind of a brand. Um, Johnson & Johnson owns the AccuView brand. They have what's called an Oasis lens, which there's many different forms of Oasis lenses. Uh, but oftentimes the ones that correct for astigmatism are overall fairly good for the eyes. They are a, a better company. They do a lot of research into their contact lenses. The um, being that somebody's over the age of 40, multifocal lenses may be a good option. However, some people can do either uh, monovision where one eye is corrected for far away and one eye is corrected for up close, or they can wear both contact lenses for distance and choose just to wear reading glasses to see up close. Depending on how your doctor feels, they can even get a little bit creative about what type of lenses and what powers that are going to work best for your eyes to make you the most comfortable and help you see the clearest at the same time. Um, but good question. I like that. Um, and just want to give a shout out to Aussie because uh, it's one of one one uh, it's one forty a.m. there. And uh, thank you so much um, in Scotland there for for tuning in. I appreciate you. Thank you. Um, and then for Diani here, um, and sorry if I'm not saying this, saying that correct, but corneal transplant was recommended due to corneal scarring. Is that really effective? So if somebody does have massive scarring on the eye, let's say from anything like trauma to the eye or a diseased eye or some like keratoconus, for example, can have severe scarring that can limit vision, then oftentimes in those situations, a corneal transplant is recommended. And that's because with scarring, there's really no way for us to get the scarring to go away. Uh, so instead, the option is to completely just do a transplant of a new cornea. Corneal transplants are, are no joke, though. Uh, they are a pretty, um, I would say, in the eye world, they're one of the more advanced procedures, especially a full penetrating keratoplasty. That's where the full cornea is removed and a new one's put on there. A... Um, 
usually you're still on medications or eye drops chronically for basically the rest of your life to prevent tissue rejection. Cause like any other transplanted tissue, you can have rejected, um, organs and transplants. And on average, corneal, uh, transplants, uh, usually last about 15 years. So it's not uncommon for people to need multiple transplants in their lifetime. Ultimately, though, um, this is something you definitely want to just discuss with your local doctor and surgeon to determine if it's best for you and what they think your uh, benefits are going to be from that procedure. But thank you for asking that. That's really, really good. Um, and I hope the best for you with whatever you decide. Again, Vanessa, thank you for another question. Uh, how do you determine what axis the toric contact lens needs to be at? Like what factors about your eye anatomy impact it? So going back to uh, that previous uh, topography on the surface of the eye, if the cornea, um, I'll use my, my, again, my little demonstration here. If, if the cornea is pinched this direction and they have more kind of with the rule astigmatism, where the flat power is side to side, uh, then usually that's around 180 um, between, um, it's about 180 degrees side to side, plus or minus 20 degrees. That's usually considered with the rule. Uh, so when we're fitting a contact lens for that, like a toric contact lens, uh, we usually try to match up a contact lens power pretty much on the dot of whatever we found their glasses prescription to be. So example, if they're, glasses, uh, cylindrical axis is at 180 degrees, then we'd fit the contact lens at about 180 degrees. The uh, challenge, though, is that we often have people back in because, again, those contact lenses have a weight. Uh, there's usually a little, if you ever hold it up, some brands are different, but most brands have a little dash mark at about six o'clock on those contact lenses. And so that that's there so that the doctor can look at the surface of the contact lens sitting on the eye, and we can see that that dash mark is at six o'clock. But sometimes that dash mark's over here by like 20 degrees, and their vision is fluctuating, and we can see that contact lens kind of rotate on their eye a little bit, and you can see that little dash mark move. If that dash mark is either to the left or to the right, we use um, something called LARS, uh, which means left add, right subtract. Uh, it's just like an easy way to remember that if you see the lens on the eye is 30 degrees to the left, then you need to add, Lars, left add, you add 30 more degrees to the 180 degrees. So um, basically you'd take 180 or what is essentially zero and you'd add 30 degrees onto that. And so the new contact lens axis power would be at 30 degrees uh, instead of originally at the 180 or zero. Uh, and same thing for just the opposite direction. If it was swung to the right, then you would subtract and you would take 180 degrees minus 30 degrees. So that'd be at 150 degrees. Uh, so hopefully that, that makes a little bit of sense. Um, that's a little bit more advanced, I guess, for, for people who either fit in contact lenses or maybe looking at going to school. Uh, or maybe you're a technician in an optometric or ophthalmic clinic and you um, are fitting contact lenses. So that's really good. Um, I do have a question from another question from June here. Um, can eye access exercises really help with myopia? Uh, overall, scientifically, there is not enough evidence to say that eye exercises can help with myopia. Uh, there have been a lot of research studies kind of looking into this, even from like the 1800s. Um, but it's not something consistent. Um, I, I've, I'm open, honestly, to a really good peer-reviewed study on this, and it doesn't seem like it would be a hard study to do. I've even contemplated setting up my own little study on myself, uh, considering I have a vision therapist, a vision rehabilitation specialist in my clinic. Uh, I've already talked with him about it, of like what I would need to do to try and do this as scientifically as possible. Because a lot of myopia has to do with axial length, how long your eyeball is, you know, from the front surface to the back surface of the eye. And so thankfully we have a device that we're likely acquiring in the next few months so we can measure that. And I might be able to go through a few months of doing the set eye exercises that many people claim help. And, um, and we'll actually see if, if that's a real thing. But again, right now, published science, um, no, 
<laughs> I wish it was, but no. Um, we have uh, Shamo. Is light therapy beneficial for extreme farsightedness? It's tough to say. I don't entirely know what you mean by light therapy. There are some research studies coming out regarding red light therapy, but that's more to do with um, how certain wavelengths of red light can activate mitochondria in cells within the retina in the back of the eye. And they're researching this for both diabetic retinopathy or um, diabetic macular edema, as well as possible macular degeneration. Um, again, it's very early research, so we still need um, more publications to come out, especially well-controlled studies. Uh, but as far as farsightedness, nearsightedness, uh, to my knowledge, I, I don't know of any specific light therapy to, um, to benefit extreme farsightedness. So hopefully that helps out a little bit. But I'll look more into it. Thank you. Um, Yuan asks, is there any way which can let astigmatism reduce over time? So astigmatism can change in your lifetime. Uh, it's usually changing because of small, minute changes to the cornea, uh, again, the front surface curvature. You can also have changes to the lens inside of the eye. But uh, what's really cool is the lens shape inside of the eye, because again, the, the lens inside the eye is curved a little bit differently on the front and the back. The, uh, the lens, usually the astigmatism in the lens is only about a quarter of a diopter of power and usually negates some of the astigmatism on the cornea on the front surface. We don't fully understand how the eye or brain does that, um, but it, it does tend to negate it a little bit. Um, so most of the little changes in astigmatism you have in your life are due to the front surface. One thing you don't want to do, especially if you have a history of keratoconus for you or your family is rub the eyes really hard. I've mentioned that in a few other videos. If you rub the eyes really hard, that may change the way protein structures of the collagen and your cornea develop. And therefore, it may thin, scar, or maybe form um, stronger amounts of astigmatism. Uh, otherwise, again, there's that theory about eyelid laxity. And as we get older, naturally, your astigmatism may reduce the amount of with the rule astigmatism. And you may kind of shift more toward against the rule astigmatism. But uh, as far as ways to get astigmatism to reduce, uh, I have no research to really support any sort of statements about that. So thank you for that. Um, thank you. Uh, just to kind of give some more information, uh, Raquel here, what does your vision therapist do in your clinic? So our vision, um, so our, our specialist, uh, Dr. Simmons, he's actually a pediatric specialist and he does a little bit of vision therapy or, or what's called vision rehabilitation. Um, so we work a lot with young children who have binocular vision issues. They have a hard time reading, focusing, uh, people who've had traumatic brain injury or some sort of head injury and are, again, having trouble focusing and using their eye muscles correctly, being able to track balls and, and moving objects. Uh, these individuals or people with chronic double vision, uh, he specializes and works a lot with assessing eye muscle movements and diagnosing neurological conditions as well as... Um, being able to prescribe exercises that have been vetted in research to help improve the neurological connect neurological connections between the brain and, and the different muscles of the eyes. Uh, it's really quite amazing. I did some of my training in my residency in more TBI vision rehabilitation. Um, and uh, you can really see a lot of people improve that way. The tough thing about the research and science and when it comes to vision therapy or vision rehab is a lot of it's anecdotal or it's not done in large scale studies or each person has a very unique set of symptoms and circumstances. So uh, it's not as, as strong of research as let's say using medications uh, where you can give people a very precise dose or they have a precise diagnosis and you can track it over time. Again, it's it's all very individualized. So a lot of that research is sometimes hard to to really read and and master. And there is always some debate between different doctors. So um, with all of that being said, um, 
I just want to say, uh, try my best to try to help this. Uh, the couple of people, Mr. Clickbait, uh, help me, please. Uh, my vision gets slightly worse when open eye to fully is it astigmatism. Um, unfortunately, I, I I can't really give an answer to that without an examination. Um, uh, however, a lot of people, I will say, whether they have astigmatism or some other type of refractive error, let's say nearsightedness, if they squint their eyes, like close them really close, um, there's something called a pinhole effect. And you're basically negating a lot of extra stray rays of light. And that will naturally kind of improve eyesight a little bit. And people with astigmatism can notice improvement by squinting their eyes a little bit. But again, it's all due to the pinhole effect. Uh, but this can be happen for people who are just nearsighted or farsighted, and sighted, having farsightedness as well. It, it all applies. So I do encourage you to seek a local eye care professional, and they should be able to um, at least give you a refraction and hopefully look inside your eye and diagnose any sort of eye condition that you may have, and they should be able to help you. Um, and then I think this may be my last question for the evening as my throat is starting to get a little raw. And again, thank you guys. Uh, Sin City Trucker. I uh, love that name too. <laughs> uh, I was a fan of uh, the comic, the graphic novel Sin City. So can double vision due to stroke improve over time? So it depends on the nature of the stroke and if the double vision affected one of the eye muscles. Even right now, I do have a patient, unfortunately, had had a pretty severe stroke and now it affected her sixth cranial nerve. And so one of her eyes is turned harsh inward. Um, usually this can improve a little bit. It's usually not a drastic improvement going back to zero. Um, depends how severe the stroke was or how significantly the, op the muscles were affected, but the, uh, usually it, it can improve. And if it does improve, it's over the first six months. Vision rehabilitation, uh, using some different eye muscle exercises may help improve things a little bit better or maybe a little faster um, or at least to a point when either having a consult with an adult strabismus specialist, this is a eye surgeon who specializes in cutting the eye muscles and reconnecting them to get the eyes straight again, or perhaps talking with uh, an eye doctor who is comfortable prescribing PRISM. Most eye doctors have uh, trained and been certified in prescribing PRISM, but some doctors feel more uh, comfortable doing it in higher degrees or amounts, especially after something like a stroke. And so they may be able to prescribe you glasses to get rid of the double vision. Um, or for anybody who happens to have had a stroke and is seeing double because of that. Thank you guys all for being here. As far as our next live, we'll be planning that for the end of next month in July. Uh, I really appreciate everybody for being here. Uh, if you have further questions, um, or, or any sort of video ideas, please let us know in the video comments because I take them all very seriously. And uh, a lot of times, again, your questions are questions other people are asking. And I hope to further my, my own knowledge in the realm of eye care uh, and through investigating all of your questions and making videos on it. Thank you again, all. Um, have a great night and we'll talk to you later.